As the fighting grinds on in Ukraine, spare a thought for some of the countries on the edge of the war zone. How stable are they these days? Just ask Moldova. The constitutional provision of neutrality is not enough to ensure Moldova's security. That's Moldova's Foreign Minister Niku Popescu. His government struggling to combat hybrid attacks from Russia and its supporters. On the streets, anti-government protests have multiplied. So have bomb hoaxes, cyber attacks and plots to bring down the government. President Maya Sandu insists that while she's in office, the country will hold on to democracy and freedom. But can it? If Ukraine were to lose the war or get trapped in a stalemate, just how long could this pro-Western state even hope to survive? Nico Popescu, welcome to Conflict Zone. Thank you for inviting me. You're living on one of the world's most dangerous tightropes, right next door to the war in Ukraine. How fragile is the situation in your country? I think all of Europe is fragile these days. And of course, Moldova as a country next to Ukraine is in a very difficult region at a very difficult time. At the same time, what the last year showed was that Ukraine is able to resist. The Ukrainian society, the Ukrainian political system, the Ukrainian army has managed to fight back, to resist, to liberate some territories. And by doing so, they also offered Moldova a greater degree of security than we fear, feared a year ago. Uh, today, uh, through its actions, through its courage, Ukraine is also defending not just Ukraine, but Moldova as well. And that is something that allows Moldova a degree of uh, capacity to continue to focus on our reforms, on managing our economy. Really? And, and I mean, you're a pro-Western government. You're under constant threat from hybrid Russian warfare, literally hundreds of bomb hoaxes, attempts to incite violent demonstrations, cyber attacks, and people squeezing your economy. Fake bomb alerts. I mean, it keeps you busy, and though, blackouts. It? Yes, it we've busy. been extremely busy managing the consequences of the war. We've had some 600,000 refugees crossing our territory. Today, around 3% of our population are refugees from Ukraine. And yet, we have managed to keep calm and peace uh, in our country. We've managed to keep stability. Uh, the situation is uh, complicated, uh, but we don't face military risks today because the, uh, Ukraine is resisting and we are able to focus on managing the other threats. But your interior minister says that uh, the situation is extremely volatile. Uh, she said democracy and peace in Europe are Russia's next targets. Moldova stands in the way of Russia's intention to break Europe's stability. We can only keep it and protect it if we're united. But you don't have that unity in your country, do you? The opinion polls suggest it's being severely tested right now. Well, we are united in Moldova in our desire to keep peace on our territory. Everybody? Really? Everybody, yeah. The absolute majority. You don't have people in Moldova arguing or calling for Russian tanks to approach our border. We have, as any normal democratic society, we have people with different political preferences, sometimes geopolitical preferences, but even those who disagree with the government want to live in a peaceful country. Even they, the pro-Moscow parties in even, Moldova, well, which currently enjoy greater support than you have it's not. It's not true. Uh, even those parties, which before were openly pro-Moscow, want to live in a country that is peaceful, that is democratic, where they have the freedom to protest, where they have the freedom to operate. So parties with a certain pro-Russian history have partly revised their approaches and they want to live in a peaceful country. They don't want to live in a dictatorship. They don't want to live in a war zone. In February, your president <coughs> publicly accused Russia of plotting to overthrow the government. Russia denied it. This was information supplied by Ukraine's President Zelensky. How close do you think your government came to being toppled? I don't think it came close. 
uh, we know that we've managed nice, to derail more than one attempt to destabilize Moldova. We've managed to derail several attempts to attack police, to take over public buildings. Our institutions are very alert. Uh, the intelligence service, the Ministry of Interior, other agencies, everyone is very alert. But the last year has proved that we are able to keep the situation reasonably calm, given the region we live, and uh, cope with this type of threats. We know that last month your intelligence service expelled two foreigners, without saying which country they were from, accused them of taking part in <coughs> subversive activities to cause a violent change to the constitutional order. That's an incredibly serious charge. Why did you let these people go if well, you were charging them with something as serious as that? Well, we have... Um, there have been several occasions. Just this year, we did not let uh, s quite a lot of foreigners to come from the country because many of them were suspected of trying to plot violences in Moldova or trying to destabilize uh, Moldovan politics or other measures. Uh, a few weeks ago, we did not let some 20 Serbian citizens, for example, uh, entering the country. Uh, and but there have been several people inside the country on serious charges. Why do you let them go? Well, in this specific case, I will not comment in details, but there are also people who have been arrested for attempts to try and uh, stoke up violence. Arrested in our and held. And held. In February, your president said your prosecutors and spies needed more powers to combat the threat from the Kremlin. Why don't they have those powers? Well, there's a conversation about increasing some of those powers, but uh, they do have now uh, more equipment to deal with some threats. And we've increased uh, significantly our cooperation with our partners, with Romania, with the countries of the European Union, with the United States, with Ukraine. You, you yourself quoted President Zelensky. So there is a lot of information sharing. There is a lot of um, uh, mutual support. And in this difficult region, uh, at this difficult time, I cannot guarantee that we know the full extent. What we know is that it's not the first plot, it's not the first attempt to destabilize Moldova. We've coped with the previous attempts from one attempt to the other. And was Russia the tactics. behind it? Was yeah, Russia it's very clear. It? Our president said it, our head of intelligence said it, and yes, Russia is working together with some Moldovan fugitives, some oligarchs, uh, and they work together to destabilize Moldova, to bring violence on the streets of Moldova, and so far they failed. In February you pushed through a so-called separatism law, making it illegal to <coughs> promote espionage and treason. The statute also bans actions that pose a serious threat to the security of the Republic. Are these actions only now being treated as crimes? A bit late, isn't it? Well, we, if you've been under threat for 30 years, well, as we, you have said a, earlier. we have a problem with a separatist region uh, since uh, even since even before our independence in 19, Transnistria, the Transnistrian region of Moldova. Yes, there's an illegal Russian military presence there, but for these last 30 uh, plus years, the situation around this region has been mostly stable, mostly calm. We've been talking to the Transnistrian regional representatives about reintegration. Uh, and our method and our way of trying to reintegrate uh, the country is dialogue, diplomacy, negotiations. That's what we're doing. At the same time, given the much more, uh, much higher security risks uh, in the in the region, we did adopt these provisions in the uh, in the criminal code, so that we are able to penalize if we need to people um, trying to undermine the territorial integrity of our country. At the same time, while talking to the Transnistrian representatives, uh, there's constant contacts. We have a deputy prime minister in charge of reintegration who is meeting his counterparts, the chief negotiator in the Transnistrian region. There have been several uh, conversations and discussions in the last year, and I can tell you that the absolute majority of the people on both sides of River Nistro including most representatives of the separatist leadership, don't want to live in a war zone. So with the 
a Transnistrian separatist leadership. Never mind the fact that they have Russian troops stationed there in uh, Transnistria. Yeah, yeah, of course the situation is... They don't is have much choice, do they? Uh, this situation is complicated, but there is a clear Putting commitment. It mildly. Yes, it but there is a clear commitment to manage the differences with our separatist region through peaceful means and dialogue and negotiations. Okay. That's what we're doing. Let me take you back to March 11th. The night before, a big protest demonstration must have been held in your capital. Police are reported to have infiltrated and broken up a group allegedly run by Russian FSB agents who were trying to organize clashes at that demonstration. How serious was this incident? All of these incidents are serious, but so is our capacity to deal with them. 25 people were detained, yes. apparently, yes. including a Russian agent? Well. They were detained to recruit and train local groups to cause trouble. Several people were detained, several people were interrogated. There's other means through which the police and the intelligence services are dealing with the situation. And I'm telling you, yes, these situations are serious. At the same time, so is our capacity to keep the calm and stability on our streets and we're alert. You keep saying that, but have all the people been released no, who the... were involved with this operation? I'm, I'm not in a position to give you, you know, a breakdown of each individual and at which stage in this procedure Let these individuals Let me put the question are. another yes. way then. Do you have any idea of how many of these groups are still operating in your country? Well, even, of course, we're monitoring several of these groups. But I don't think Several anyone being, would. what, more than five? Well, the less than the 10, intelligence what? services and the police are working on that. Uh, what we know so is that... constant threat. There's constant threat, there's an adaptation of this threat, but there's constant failure to bring violence on the streets in Kishinev. And the reason for that is that abs the absolute majority of the people, the absolute majority of the political parties, including most political parties that uh, do not support the government, they also don't want to live in a country where you have violence on the streets. So there's a clear societal consensus behind uh, managing the political process in Moldova through standard democratic procedures. The view of the European Council on Foreign Relations is that March 12th was a preparatory and reconnaissance exercise for the Russian operatives, not a full dress rehearsal, but an opportunity to test the responses of your security services and the coordination mechanism among the various agencies. Do you buy that? Well, uh, we've been in this mode for over a year. There's a constant uh, attempt to impose stress on Moldova, on our society, on our economy, on our political system. You mentioned it yourself, cyber attacks, fake, fake bomb alerts, trying to infiltrate Moldova with people who are supposed to destabilize the country. So what you described is a near constant situation, but at the same time, we've been living with this type of situations, we've been managing to keep stability, we've been coping with this type of stress, and we'll continue to do so. The conclusion of the European Council is that uh, Russian actions strongly suggest Moscow is preparing for a full-scale insurrection in Moldova, and upcoming presidential elections in 2024 and parliamentary elections would give them a window of opportunity. Is that a scenario that you give any credence to? Well, that's coming from a think tank. Uh, that's their opinion. What I can sure, tell you. the only people who are talking. Listen, these I mean, days, most. No, know? no, no. But I mean, most elections are unpredictable. What I can tell you with clarity is that the absolute majority of the people in Moldova uh, want to be living, want to live in a country that is free, stable, and peaceful. And this is what this government is offering. Uh, even on the opposition side, most opposition parties also want to keep peace, calm, and the liberty of our country. Last October, the Washington Post reviewed documents obtained by Ukrainian intelligence, which showed that Russia's FSB had channeled millions of dollars to a network of Moldovan politicians, the aim being to push the country away from the EU and towards Moscow. Do you know which of your politicians belonged to that network that was receiving millions of dollars? Well, we have uh, had politicians who stole hundreds of millions of dollars from the Moldovan population, and many of them have received, indeed, uh, Russian cash. Uh, some of them 
are being investigated, but what I would again tell you is that they failed. They failed to derail Moldova from the path to the European Union and from democracy. And I will but tell they you may that they have nonetheless infiltrated your structures. Yes, and, uh, and that, that may still be the case. Yeah, that may still you be the case. You can't rule that out, can you? Uh, it's quite clear that Russia has been supporting political parties uh, in Moldova and political and uh, politicians. Yes, that's and quite clear. And has bought influence with money, with these millions of dollars. Uh, that's quite likely, yes. Do you know who you can trust in your country these well, days? Well, uh, what we know is that this attempt to buy, to, f to derail, to manipulate have largely failed. Moldova has been a democracy for 30 years. All our governments have changed as a result of elections. Several attempts by some leaders to impose autocratic rule in Moldova failed. Several attempts to derail Moldova from the path to the European Union, including by previous President Dodon, including by uh, an oligarch who ruled Moldova a few years ago, Plachotniuk, they all failed to derail Moldova from the path to the EU. Uh, and I'm very confident that our society will, strong, will stay strongly engaged and will support us in bringing the country into the European Union. Just days before the president spoke about a coup attempt, your prime minister, Natalia Gavrilita, resigned, blaming crises caused by Russian aggression. And not a great time, perhaps, to have a government reshuffle. Was she, was she told to resign or was she sacrificed because the country's facing huge economic problems and someone had to take the blame? Well, it's, the, that, same, the, it's the same majority in power. It's the same president. And no, most I'm talking of about her resignation. Was yeah, she, yeah. Did she jump or was she pushed? Well, uh, there was a mutual decision. Uh, there never to change is the a mutual decision. Well, but at the same time, there never she was is. Pushed, then. Well, there was a conversation and there was a joint decision of the uh, representatives of the parliamentary majority to change the prime minister. Uh, most of the government is the same, the president is the same, the parliamentary majority is the same, but there has been a change in prime minister. Uh, because to you a prime needed minister. a sacrificial lamb. No, because there was a, a, a prime minister, who, the new prime minister has a more background in, uh, he's a former minister of interior, he's, he's a former national security advisor to the president. So uh, this decision was based on the idea that uh, looking into the near future, Moldova will face and is facing significantly increased uh, security risks and therefore uh, the, the focus now is much more, uh, there's much more emphasis on the need to manage the security situation and the previous Prime Minister Natalia Gavrilica mostly comes with an economic background and that is what explains this change. What makes you think the replacement Prime Minister will be able to do any better? I mean, the realities that they have to deal with are the same. Runaway inflation running at around 30 percent. <coughs> Utility bills have hit the roof. Poverty is increasing. Um, what makes you think the new Prime Minister will do well, any better? Well, this governing team of which the former and the current Prime Minister are part of the same team, uh, and I am part of this team, and that's the team of President Maya Sandu, we've managed to cope with the risks in the last year. Uh, I will give you a couple of examples. The last winter is the first winter in Moldova's his history into which we went with significant gas reserves. We've managed to go through this winter with the heating on and the lights on. Back in October, November, our electricity uh, security of electricity supply was threatened because of the Russian brutal bombing of the Ukrainian um, uh, electricity infrastructure. We had several instances of blackouts, but nonetheless, we've managed to ensure throughout the winter that the lights in our homes were on. So our governing team has managed to avoid and has managed to manage uh, with calm and efficiency, massive problems. Electricity, energy, heating, hybrid work. You, you say this, but a recent poll by Magenta Consulting showed 56% blaming the government for their economic hardship. Um, at the same time, the governing party of Action and Solidarity and President Maya Sandu are the most popular politicians by far in the country. And we do continuously enjoy a high level of support. Of course, 30% inflation, seven-fold increase in uh, gas costs, four-fold increase in electricity costs. The negative effect of Russia's brutal war on Moldova is uh, uh, Russia's brutal war on Ukraine is imposing hardship on our population. 
uh, is generating negative effects for dozens of countries in the world. Moldova is extremely exposed, but we've managed these risks and will continue doing so. Let's look at your relationship with NATO. Its boss, Jens Stoltenberg, called you a close and highly valued partner. Um, despite the pressure you're under, Moldova's constitution still declares the country to be neutral. Uh, given what's been happening in your country, how long do you think that neutrality will last? So the constitution was adopted in 1994. So this provision on Moldova's neutrality has been there for almost 30 years. Time uh, for change? Well, what is clear is, is that Moldova definitely needs and has already started changing its security and defense policy. We've been increasing our security and defense capabilities. We've been dramatically and, and very rapidly expanding and deepening our cooperation with uh, those countries and organizations that support peace in Moldova, liberty in Moldova. And here, of course, I would start with Romania, with the United States, with Germany, with France, with NATO, with the European Union. We've been very busy uh, strengthening Moldova's security and defense partnerships. I just partnerships. want to come back to that issue of yeah. neutrality, because in January, your defense minister, Anatoly Nasati, said you were now asking Western partners, presumably NATO, for air defense system. And he said the war in Ukraine has shown that Moldova's neutral status and the discussion about Moldova's demilitarized status are no longer current. Moldova's neutral status is no longer current. That's quite a significant change of policy, isn't it? So you're now going to seek full membership of NATO? Well, at this stage, there's a political conversation in Moldova about the best ways to ensure our security. But he's but, made the decision, hasn't he? He's saying the decision's been made. The, Moldova's such neutral status yeah, is no longer Such current. decisions are taken uh, by the parliament. So was he speaking the, out of turn? Was he not well, authorized to What we're to doing that? today is we're increasing security and defense cooperation with the European Union, with NATO, and the member states of his organizations. But is he wrong? The defense minister, is he wrong? What I can tell you is that uh, the constitutional provision of neutrality is not enough to ensure Moldova's security. What is going to ensure our security is a strong partnership and strong support from those countries that support us and our liberty. And these are the member states of NATO and the European Union and these two organizations. Mr. Popescu, it sounds like the decision has already been made. You're just not prepared to formally announce it. Oh. That this neutrality is no longer in place. Well, neutrality is a constitutional provision that is in place. At the same time, it's not enough. On paper only. Uh, it's not enough to keep the security of our country, and we are working day and night to increase the security of our country by strengthening our security and defense partnership with countries that, su that support us. And here, I would like to also to um, quote. Uh, President uh, Klaus Johannes of Romania, who several times said that under no circumstances Romania would abandon Moldova. And on the full spectrum of threats, Romania would always stand by Moldova, would always support Moldova. And that's something which we value in Moldova. It's something which gives us reassurance uh, in our future, in our European future, and in our ability to keep Moldova free and part of the free world together and along with Romania and all other partners from the European Union and NATO. Do you believe, if we look at the war that's going on in Ukraine, do you believe that there can be a full and complete victory by Ukraine, as President Zelensky is holding out for at the moment? Well, in Moldova, we're very grateful to Ukraine. It's not what I ask. Yes for defending themselves and by doing so defending Moldova. And our hope and the hope of our society is that Ukraine would liberate its territories and our continent and Ukraine and Moldova and the other countries in Europe can go back to a situation where Europe is peaceful, countries are not aggressed, territories are not occupied and we do hope and we do support in Moldova Ukraine's liberation of all of its territories. You still didn't answer my question. Do you believe that is still possible? Well, I... In your heart I, of hearts? Yes, and I cannot you predict... You at night believing just that this me, is what's Neither me nor you can predict the future. I'm asking you what, what you believe. You yeah, live on the front line. Uh, so what we hope 
is that Ukraine will do that and the West, Europe, the United States, all the countries in the world for whom, for which international law matters, will support Ukraine in this endeavor. All the countries that want to be protected by international law need to support Ukraine as well in its capacity to liberate its territories brutally occupied by Russia. And if Ukraine should lose or get stuck in a semi-permanent stalemate, what then for you? Well, for Moldova, as a government, we have a duty to be preparing for all kinds of scenarios, for Are negative and for, for positive. One? So we have to prepare for all kinds of scenarios, including that scenario. Of course, for easier scenario, for positive scenarios, it's easier to prepare. But as a government, we're totally obliged to be preparing for the full spectrum of scenarios, including this one, scenarios which are even worse or better. But generally, I am confident in Moldova's future. I am confident in our capacity to keep peace and liberty and the path to the European Union. There is a strong societal desire to continue with that. And uh, we in Moldova hope this war will come to an end uh, as soon as possible, that Ukraine will liberate its territories and uh, Europe and, and the United States and Canada and Japan and all the countries that support the freedom of Ukraine will continue being strongly engaged in supporting Ukraine. Uh, and by doing that would also uh, help Moldova overcome the negative effects of this war. Niku Popescu, thank you very much for being on Conflict Zone. Thank you. Thank you.